All right, seven years ago, our own Chris Hayes wrote, much of movement conservatism is a con, and the base are the marks. That observation was certainly true at the time, but now it's far more important because the con is not just most of conservatism anymore. With Trump at the top, it's the entire movement. This week, former White House strategist Steve Bannon became the latest Trump associate to be taken into custody when the Chinese-owned yacht on which he was sunbathing was boarded by U.S. Postal Service agents. Bannon was accused of defrauding people who gave tens of millions of dollars to a private fund which existed, Bannon claimed, to finance construction of the border wall. Federal prosecutors said that the real purpose of that fund, called We Build the Wall, was to cover the luxury lifestyle of Bannon and the other defendants. Now, depending on how you count it, and in honor of conservatives, we shall count conservatively tonight, Steve Bannon is now the seventh former close Trump advisor to be arrested, face charges, plead guilty, or be convicted of a crime since Donald Trump took office. The seventh. As the New York Times' Michelle Goldberg writes, quote, the truth is that we build, we build the wall is what Trumpist's private enterprise looks like, a gaudy scam that monetizes grievance. And it's a scam that speaks to a much larger problem with the GOP and its base. Conservative operatives, uh, operatives like Steve Bannon have always seemed to view the right's rank and file with utter contempt, as little more than a collection of fools to be taken advantage of. Con men see their marks. MSNBC's Steve Bannon, spelt differently in no relation, notes, quote, many prominent Republican voices, Newt, Newt Gingrich, Mike Huckabee, et al., have created lucrative mailing lists used for highly dubious purposes. Similarly, the rise of the Tea Party in the Obama era led to the creation of scam PACs that targeted conservative donors, but existed mostly to pad the pockets of the consultants who ran them. It's not about their beliefs, it's about their bottom line. Now, while previous Republican administrations had their share of those who were trying to personally profit and those willing to break the law to serve the political interests of the president, the Trump administration is unique. Look at another example just from this week. It was revealed that the Senate Intelligence Committee made criminal referrals of Donald Trump Jr., Jared Kushner, Steve Bannon, Eric Prince, and Sam Clovis to federal prosecutors in 2019, passing along their suspicions that these Trump-linked officials may have misled the committee during their testimonies. The large number of people in direct contact with this president, often for years, who are revealed to be out-and-out out fraudsters or possible criminals, just keeps growing. As former Bush official Paul Rosenzweig writes, this level of criminality surrounding a president is unparalleled. The president was asked yesterday about the criminal syndicate of sort that hangs around him. Respectfully, sir, it's not just Steve Bannon, it's Roger Stone, it's Michael Flynn, it's Rick Gates, Paul Manafort, Michael Cohen. What's it say about your judgment that these are the kind of people well, who are affiliated Well, I have no idea. With? How did all these people get into Trump's inner circle? Trump has no idea. None at all. So I should note that we cut off the sound by because the president then went on to a lie, uh, actually a lot of lies about the Obama administration. There's no need to amplify those lies. But Trump has made an effort to brand himself as the president of law and order. Look at the people he surrounds himself with. Look at him. Robert Mueller detailed nearly a dozen potential instances of obstruction of justice by Trump during the Russia investigation. Trump paid $2 million in fines and closed his family foundation after admitting that it had used donations to pay campaign and business expenses, some personal expenses too. The prosecutors in that case, in the New York Attorney General's office, are still investigating Trump's banking and tax conduct. Federal prosecutors in New York, the ones that bring charges against that are bringing charges against Steve Bannon, are also looking at alleged fraud by Trump's inaugural committee. And then there is the Manhattan District Attorney, which is investigating Trump's tax records. In fact, just breaking tonight, a federal appeals court has refused to give Trump immediate relief to stop his accounting records from being turned over to a New York State grand jury. Instead, scheduling arguments for September 1st over whether the subpoena of, of Trump's records should be paused. Now, that filing followed an earlier ruling by U.S. District Judge Victor Marrero, who denied Trump's request to put his decision dismissing the lawsuit on hold to allow the president's legal team time to appeal. Trump's associates are literal con men, grifters, and base criminals. Trump himself is using the power of the presidency to block details about his own alleged criminal conduct from coming to light. The length, the breadth, and the depth of this con is all-consuming.
And that is what separates the Trump world con from all the other conservative con jobs that came before. This con has, has consumed the Republican Party. The GOP has been taken over by the Trump con. Republicans don't stand up to Trump. They don't stop him. They don't excommunicate him. Their silence is a tacit acceptance of his con and the cons of his associates, a tacit acceptance that their base, conservatives, can be duped again and again and again. Party officials have had years to stop it, and they've barely tried. The Republican Party is now becoming one big con, no longer representing conservative ideals or values, but representing and defending one con man and the cons around him. Michelle Goldberg writes, the, societal philosoph the social philosopher Eric Hoffer wrote that in America, every mass movement ends up as a racket, a cult, or a corporation. Trumpism reversed this. The racket came first. Leading off our discussion tonight is Neil Katyal, former acting U.S. Solicitor General and an MSNBC legal contributor. Neil, good to see you. Thank you for being with us. This, is, this just becomes hard to process after a while. The degree and the depth of stuff, and then you have to read it on a whole new thing, the we build the wall. It, it, it's, it's, not even, it's not even complicated, high-level, highly sophisticated con stuff. They opened a, a, a page, a crowdfunding page, took money, said they were going to spend it on the wall. Uh, didn't quite happen that way. Absolutely, Ali. As I listened to you, I was so glad you started the show this way about two things, con men and criminals. Um, because, you know, Chris Hayes was exactly right when he wrote that about what the Republican Party had become some years ago, really a con. And what the Bannon episode shows is really that at its height. I mean, what Bannon has done here is not a bug. It's a feature of the modern Republican Party. It's her whole they're lining their pockets. Um, and Hillary Clinton might have used the word deplorable, but it's these folks who are really treating the American people as deplorables. And so that's on the con men side. And on the lawlessness side, absolutely, Ali. It was so glad you, you quoted Paul Rosenzweig, who's a very strong Republican lawyer. Um, there's a culture of criminality around Trump and his inner circle. And it's not just, you know, Steve Bannon, who was the president's chief strategist. It was Paul Manafort, who's in jail, who's been jailed, uh, who is pre the president's campaign manager. It was Rick, Rick, Rick Gates, his deputy campaign manager. It was Roger Stone, his clo Trump's close political confidant. It was Michael Cohen, his personal lawyer. I mean, it's person, oh, my, you know, Michael Flynn, the, his president's national security advisor. It's like, who around the president hasn't been indicted at this point. Right. It's, as you say, it's, it's not a bug, it's a feature. Uh, in the beginning when these things would happen, Trump uh, tried to throw them under the bus. I don't really know them. I'm not really close. But uh, now that we're on the seventh or eighth, depending on how you count it, and you just, you just enumerated them, you just named them all, there is no space between the president and all of these people. Exactly. And I'm not sure I've named them all. I think there are others. And indeed, this week, we really learned, and you just started to advert to this at the top of your show, you know, the New York prosecutors, both federal and state, have been investigating Donald Trump personally, because Trump went and evidently tried to deduct his $130,000 in payments to porn star Stormy Daniels as a business expense. And so New York prose federal prosecutors were investigating that, as the state ones were. The federal prosecution after Bill Barr mysteriously disappeared, but the state one did not. And the president had been subpoenaed, and the Supreme Court said, yeah, Mr. President, it looks like you've got to turn that information over. And just yesterday, a federal judge in New York said, yeah, Mr. President, you've got to turn that information over. And the president is trying through these desperate appeals today to try and stop that. But this is the rule of law asserting itself. It's a genius of our founders. It's the state prosecutors coming and saying, not so fast. You don't get to stymie us this time. We want this information, and we're going to get a court order to do it. Neil, let me ask you uh, about what happens next, because time is short uh, before the next election, and the next election may solve this issue or it may not. Uh, but Lawrence was talking, uh, he was with Joe Biden uh, in May during a, a last word town hall in which a viewer asked Joe Biden as president how he would handle this. Let's listen to the exchange. From Edward in Ohio, and this is for uh, Vice President Biden. 
Sir, if you were to win the election, would you be willing to commit to not polling a President Ford and giving Donald Trump a pardon under the pretense of healing the nation? In other words, are you willing to commit to the American ideal that no one is above the law? Absolutely, yes. I commit. He, he's talking about not pulling a president forward. He wants a commitment that that uh, that Joe Biden is going to pursue, continue to pursue Donald Trump and his associates and his family and his businesses and his foundation. What does that look like to you? Well, I think uh, uh, Vice President Biden's absolutely right to say nobody should be above the law. And he's also right to not commit in advance to some prosecutorial or non-prosecutorial strategy. I mean, the whole fault of Trump is that he uses the Justice Department as his personal army to go after his enemies and to benefit his friends, doling out pardons and commutations and the like. And that is a sin. That is, you know, anyone who worked at the Justice Department, that is the last thing you do. So when Trump's said lock her up and all that stuff in 2016 it was reprehensible and i'm so glad to see vice president biden who understands the traditions of our justice department understands the american tradition of the rule of law not trying to pull those stunts and yeah you can probably get some votes that way but i think people like biden understand the presidency's not worth that. We don't cheat that way. We don't like to diminish our great institutions by trying to tarnish them by saying we're gonna use this to go after our political enemies. I mean, that's what Russia does. And that's why I suspect Donald Trump writes love letters to Putin and, you know, it came out this week, oh. you know, wrote a love letter basically saying, I so respect you, Mr. Putin and stuff like that. You know, that's not the way an American president should behave. I mentioned in the intro to this uh, more reporting out of the, the Senate Intelligence Committee. I just want to read you uh, some of this. The Intelligence Committee, one person said, reserved its harshest allegations for the president's former chief strategist, Stephen K. Bannon, former campaign co-chair Sam Clovis, and private security contractor Eric Prince, saying it had reason to believe all three had lied to congressional investigators a uh, potential fel felony. That's reporting from the Washington Post. Uh, so... I, I just I'm trying to put this whole net together of, of uh, corruption, lawlessness, grifters, con men and liars. Um, it, it all sort of blends together at some point. So yes, and I think there, Ali, you buried the lead of that Senate report, because that was a report by the Republican-led Senate Intelligence Committee, and it said that Donald Trump knew and discussed those stolen Democratic emails in the 2016 points, that he knew that that had been discussed with the Russians. And they rejected, this committee rejected the idea where that Trump said, as he said to prosecutors, I didn't remember my conversations with Roger Stone. They said, no, despite Trump's recollection, the committee assesses that Trump did in fact speak with Stone about WikiLeaks and with members of his campaign about Stone's access to WikiLeaks. So it is a a direct repudiation by the Senate Republican Intelligence Committee about Trump's own story when it comes to the Russians. The bottom line here is every time it's about Russia and Trump, there are lies. There are lies with Stone, there are lies with Trump, there are lies with Flynn, person after person. And finally, I think we're starting to get to the bottom of it. Uh, that Senate report, by the way, is 966 pages long. Uh, Steve Bannon, uh, in typical form after being arrested, uh, came out and made a statement. Let's listen to it. Look, what I said yesterday, this fiasco is a total political hit job. The timing's is exquisite. I am not going to back down. This is a political hit job. Everybody knows I love a fight. This was to stop and intimidate people that want to talk about the wall. This is to stop and intimidate people that have President Trump's back on building the wall. Uh, Neil Kotchel, as a lawyer, is not much of a defense. I didn't hear a defense, and I think if I'm Steve Bannon, I'd be particularly worried because three other defendants were indicted, and the first thing federal prosecutors do is go and try and get those to flip on the bigger fish here, which is Steve Bannon. And I suspect they will flip, or someone will. And then the question is, will Bannon flip? And who will Bannon flip on? His former boss, perhaps.